we've already got everyone who's like the line is dying down. People are getting ready for the rise. And, um, and I know people will trickle in, but uh, you know, Dr. Queen is uh, one of Danny's mentors and was going to introduce Danny, but he's traveling this week, so he asked me to introduce her. And it's always a privilege for me to introduce our own faculty. So Danny and I met uh, when she started, um, actually when she interviewed back in, in 2012. But if you don't know anything about Danny, um, she uh, is originally from China, and she got her bachelor's in chemistry from Zhejiang. She's trying to help with the pronunciation uh, university, but she loved chemistry so much, she came to the University of Minnesota to study a PhD. And uh, her PhD uh, was done here in Dr. Arianka's lab. And then she decided that her next step was really not just to be an important scientist in chemistry, but also to apply that knowledge. So she subsequently moved to Johns Hopkins, where she was a clinical chemistry fellow. And they loved her so much, and she was so successful there, she was on the faculty for two years. Now she missed her Minnesota winters and decided to, <laughs> to come back. So in 2012, she came back and was recruited as an assistant professor and director of clinical chemistry. And it's really a privilege for me to kind of see your remarkable progress. So it's always hard when you pick up and you retool and you start in a new place and have to kind of pick up this new role of education and administration and research. But, but Danny's always had an interest in math spec. And it's fun to just kind of watch her last, especially last couple of years when that really launched. So Danny's really uh, been successful at getting extramural sponsored contracts uh, for looking at biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease. And it's led to two really high impact papers in, in a journal. Uh, a journal that um, is called Alzheimer's and Dementia. It has an impact factor of almost 12. So she's published two first author papers on that. And so Danny, I'm really proud to introduce you. I'm looking forward to hearing your talk about you know, biological mechanisms of frailty and older adults. I don't know a lot about mass spec, but I'm interested in learning. Thank you. very kind introduction and I'm very happy to be here and to share with you my research actually particularly uh, some of the findings that uh, we had uh, last year and from uh, the research that uh, Mike just described. So the title of my talk is Exploring Biological Mechanisms of Frailty in Older Adults, Hydroxy Sphingomyelins as Independent Plasma Biomarkers of Physical Function. So I have nothing to disclose. So, so the objectives of my talk is first to describe uh, what is frailty, uh, its characteristics, prevalence, significance, and the current landscape of hypothesized biological mechanisms leading to frailty in older adults. Uh, secondarily, I'd like to outline a new scientific framework and premise that support plasma metabolites, in particular hydroxy sphingomyelins as novel biomarkers of physical function decline. And thirdly, I'd like to summarize literature that illustrate a theoretical connection between hydroxy sphingomyelins, uh, neurodegeneration, impaired physical function, and frailty. So what is frailty and why it's so important to study frailty? So this concept is new to me as well, as I just you know, started to exploring it. So frailty is, is a clinical syndrome that is characterized by vulnerability to adverse health outcomes, such as falls, low physical ability, fatigue, lose ability to live independently, and mortality. So um, not only that frailty is associated with adverse health outcomes, but frailty actually skyrockets uh, healthcare costs. So uh, it's an emerging area of research. So there hasn't been much research to understand the economic impact of frailty. But there has been a lot of publication that to determine the relationship of frailty and post-operative -op costs. <coughs> so this is a study that published in, excuse me, this is a study that um, published in the American Journal of Surgery. That, so the results that from this study is to looking at uh, the relationship of frailty and total six months post-operative costs. <coughs> so as you can see here, that being frail will double or triple that the cost than um, not frail. So this is really, um, again, demonstrate that 
um, the, the important research that we need to put in to understand frailty and prevent frailty so that we can reduce um, the increased health co cost related to that. So you may wonder then, you know, how, how is frailty is defined? Well, frailty have actually five well-accepted characteristics. Weight loss, um, low physical activity, slow walking speed, exhaustion, and low grip strength. However, that uh, because it's such a new area of research that um, studies has different <laughs> definitions um, of those frailty characteristics. So this table uh, basically shows that how two different studies, the ERIC study and the CHS study, define uh, each component of the characteristic. So take weight loss as an example. Uh, ERIC study defined uh, weight loss as 10% weight loss since last visit, or a body mass index less than 18.5. Uh, in contrast, uh, CHS study that defined weight loss as loss un unintentional weight loss of more than 10 pounds in last year. So clearly you see the differences in the definitions, and I'm not going to go into the detail of each definition, but um, and also um, the, the frailty um, as this clinical syndrome is defined by three or more of those characteristic presence. And also there's a pre field stage that defined by one or two of those component presence. And if an individual has none of those um, symptoms that presence, and it's considered robust. So um, but surprisingly, that despite that different definitions that they use by uh, both studies that the frailty prevalence that uh, in those two patient population, uh, cohort population that has um, the same, which is about 7%. So that means that we have, we now, according to those studies, that we know the prevalence of uh, frailty is about uh, 7% in older adults that uh, with ages above 65. So, um, in addition to the um, adverse health outcome and increased health care costs associated with frailty, also that we know because of the aging, increased aging population, that the prevalence of frailty will likely double by 2060. Um, and then also, um, frailty is actually most prevalent in the age group between 76 and 84. And females, blacks, are more likely to be frail. Um, also, frailty is associated with self-rated health, chronic diseases, but not cancer. And frailty is associated with both physical and cognitive, co cognitive function decline. And frailty is also associated with some of the laboratory tests that we do, uh, in, and such as low cholesterol, low hemoglobin, uh, high white blood cell count, high C CRP, and high hemoglobin. So in summary of so far that what I have talked about, so frailty is highly prevalent in older adults, and it's associated with uh, severe health outcome and also increased health care cost. So just like many diseases and clinical syndrome, that frailty takes years to develop. So um, by the time that um, it reaches uh, the stage of um, it, the characteristics such as slowness, weakness, that it's basically indicate the end stage of functional impairment that will require intensive treatment um, and, and then the effect of those treatments may not be optimal. So what, what are the strategies that we have to uh, prevent or slow down frailty so that we can reduce the adverse health outcome and reduce health care costs. So one of the 
um, strategy that we have, just like in many other diseases, early detection and early intervention. So if we can identify an individual at risk uh, of frailty early and intervene early, then we potentially bend the curve so that we can slow down uh, the development of function decline and then to prevent or reduce the frailty. So, kind of, so that's, that's actually uh, the kind of the um, strategy that's uh, in the field uh, because there's no, um, also there's no uh, other effective treatments uh, for frailty. So, so what about um, our current understanding of the uh, things that would cause frailty? Or in other words, how much do we really understand the bio biological mechanisms and associated biomarkers that are leading to frailty? Unfortunately, that our understanding uh, is very limited. Um, although we know uh, through those epidemiologic studies that um, there's uh, some certain risk factors such as uh, um, inflammatory diseases, and um, however, that most of the um, but those diseases that does not actually uh, tell us specific information about the pathophysiological mechanisms, and even um, there are some biomarker research in the field. However, that uh, they are very limited that in the way that mostly they're focused on focused on inflammation and neuroendocrine endocrine dysfunction. Uh, and then although um, those biomarkers such as IL-6 and IGF-1 and uh, st sex steroids are informative um, for us to understand, but we really need new biomarkers that will help us to understand uh, and then the mechanism better and also provide uh, normal insights. So therefore, that uh, I would argue that we need uh, to do more research to, uh, in terms of uh, discovering biomarkers to, um, you know, for risk prediction and to identify individuals that are at risk for frailty. And also, those biomarkers could also be used as surrogate biomarkers that for later outcome, so that we could actually understand the interaction of those um, uh, risk factor early on, and then also those biomarkers that can be used to elucidating molecular mechanisms that, so that we could use uh, the understanding to develop uh, therapeutics to improve um, uh, function uh, impairment in uh, frail or pre older adults. So, so that's that's um, the the kind of the background information for the research that uh, that I'm going to present to you uh, today. So now I'd like to illustrate to you the scientific framework that I'm working with. So the scientific framework is um, is such that um, we believe that we could use plasma metabolite to understand the uh, pathophysiological mechanisms that are uh, leading to frailty. Um, and then, so first of all, we believe that there's a uh, vicious cycle between um, what's happening outside the brain and in the brain. So um, in, in case there's neural uh, degeneration, those biochemical changes that happen in the brain associated with neurodegeneration that could actually be detected in the plasma. And on the other hand, um, plasma as a, uh, as a reservoir collecting systemic information could also reflect our body react to the neurodegeneration that happens in the brain. So because of that, we think that there's a vicious cycle between that um, what's happening outside the body and uh, what's happening inside the brain, and therefore that we could use plasma metabolite to monitor those uh, changes happen 
and particularly in associated with neural de degeneration. And then also that um, because we know neural degeneration leading to cognitive function decline, and also, uh, which is also associated with frailty, so that we believe by using plasma metabolites that we could actually understand the pathophysiological mechanism both leading to uh, cognitive function decline as well as frailty. So I'd like to present, um, so first um, I have done um, some work in terms of understanding the association of plasma metabolites <coughs> with cognitive function decline. So, I'm, um, so those were two studies that Mike has mentioned to you that I published last year. So first, that we actually performed a cross-sectional study to looking at uh, association of plasma metabolites with cognitive status, uh, which are normal uh, mild cognitive impairment and dementia. And so the um, second study that we did is actually a cohort study that we're looking at the association of plasma metabolites with incident uh, mild cognitive impairments and dementia. So the difference of, between those studies is that first study we're looking at cross-sectionally the association, but second study that we're looking at the baseline levels of those metabolites and in their relation to cognitive function decline in, uh, in, in a um, cohort of participants. And, we, and I, I actually, uh, both papers actually we uh, did in the uh, ERIC study, um, which we'll tell you a little bit more about later. So through those two uh, studies that basically we actually, um, through our own work that we established there's a, a relationship between plasma metabolites and cognitive function decline. So now I'm going to present to you some uh, of our unpublished uh, work on the association with uh, plasma metabolites with frailty and specifically that we look at one of the frailty uh, characteristic which is a physical function decline. So here's our study design. So it's a cross-sectional study of 383 participants in uh, visit five of the atherosclerosis risk in community study, the ERIC study. So um, ERIC study is a prospective um, study that initially uh, started in um, 1987 uh, with the intent to evaluating the uh, etiology of arthrosclerotic diseases in a biracial uh, population. So, um, so over the years that this study has evolved, and so that um, in 2011 and 13, uh, the study that uh, basically re, uh, re invited uh, all the living participants back and then evaluating their um, uh, cognitive as well as physical function. So um, in this visit, five, there's over uh, 6,000 participants that provided blood samples and also have their cognitive and physical function comprehensively uh, examined. And that's why we would be, we would be able to obtain a uh, blood sample as well as uh, physical function outcomes that, uh, that I'm going to tell you about. So in terms of uh, the biochemical, um, the biomarkers that the plasma metabolites that we actually measured in the study. We uh, actually uh, did the biochemical analysis of plasma using uh, targeted metabolomics, um, which I can share with you uh, later. But basically, this is a, a, a approach that will allow you to um, measure uh, over 180 metabolites, and 90 of them uh, are phospholipids, and 15 of them are sphingolipids, 40 of them are, are acetylcarnitines, and 20 of them, 21 of them are amino acids, and 21 of them are biogenic amino acids. So, 
the physical outcomes that we actually uh, evaluated in study are three different physical outcome measures. First is the grip strength. Um, and then second is actually a lower extremity physical function that uh, assessed using um, three different tasks and repeated chair stance, balance, and four meter usual paced walk. And then the score from those three uh, different tasks were combined together to give you a short physical performance battery score. And then also walking speed was used um, as a separate outcome measure because walking speed is the most clinically feasible outcome among those three, and it's the sixth vital sign of health in older adults, and it's the most sensitive uh, predictor of mot mortality and frailty. So therefore, that uh, walking speed is used as a separate outcomes, and all three outcomes that were uh, actually um, included in the data analysis. So um, for data analysis, first, actually, um, our primary analysis focused on 12 uh, metabolites that were previously, uh, from our study, we found to be associated with, it, with cognitive function. And then we evaluating uh, those uh, 12 metabolites and their association with uh, physical uh, function outcomes um, that I mentioned in the previous slide. And then secondarily, that we actually looking at the remaining metabolites. So uh, both in our in both our primary and secondary analysis, that we adjusted covariance, um, including uh, the ones that uh, in associate, uh, including the ones that um, such as the cardiovascular risk factor, demographics such as age, sex. Um, and then um, BMI, et cetera, as well as comorbidities such as um, uh, diseases such as heart failure and heart disease and uh, stroke. So, here, here is the information of our study population. As I mentioned before, um, this population was actually used initially to looking at the association of plasma metabolites with uh, cognitive status and cognitive uh, function, uh, decline of cognitive function. So therefore that um, our study population used here, including uh, three different cognitive status, which um, are normal, MCI, and dementia. Um, so, and the added benefit to having a very diverse uh, cognitive status is because that due to association of cognitive function and physical function, that uh, our study population has also a very diverse uh, you know, physical function outcomes. So um, also, it's not surprising to, say, to, to, uh, to have the dementia uh, group that to be older as well as having a um, you know, higher risk of cardiovascular disease, and then also higher prevalence of comorbidities such as uh, heart disease and heart failure and stroke. So, he, so here actually um, is, our, is our primary data analysis results. So, um, to the, left, to the left of this figure is the list of 12 metabolites that we uh, evaluated in our primary uh, data analysis. So um, for, we actually uh, determined the association of each of those metabolites uh, with each of those um, physical function outcome grip strength um, SPPB score as well as four meter, four meter walking speed. So, um, and then for each of those associations, we adjusted uh, the covariance using different models. We actually have three different models. Uh, in the first model, we adjusted for age, sex, race, 
and the center that those participants were evaluated. And second model, uh, we included additional adjustment for APOE, which is a risk factor for uh, Alzheimer's disease and associated with cognitive function, uh, BMI, uh, cardiovascular risk factor, and comorbidity. And then the last model, we also uh, did ad additional adjustment for uh, dementia status as well as cognitive function. So, um, so as you can see, maybe not very well, but I just wanted to point it out that um, so the, the, we actually found among those 12 metabolites that were significantly associated with cognitive outcome, six of them were actually also assist, associated with physical function outcome after multiple adjustments. So, um, and then five, five of them, um, and so one of them, which is a, um, a symmetric dimethyl arginine, who is, has lower level, is actually associated with better outcome. And the rest of those um, five metabolites, whose higher level is actually associated with better outcome. So um, per particularly, we were interested in um, hydroxy uh, single myelin because among the six that we found to be significantly associated with uh, physical outcomes that three of them belong to this group of hydroxy single myelin. So what are those hydroxy single myelin? Well, they are the hydroxy derivatives of single myelin. So, um, here is a structure of single myelin. So uh, it has three um, moieties. Uh, the, sorry, the, um, the phosphocholine uh, head group, and the single thing, and then the fatty acid moiety. So hydroxy single myelin is with a hydroxy group adding to a single uh, myelin. But this hydroxy group can actually exist at different part of the, uh, the, the sphingomyelin molecule, it could be on the sphingosane chain or on the fatty acid chain. And, and then also their position on those chains could vary as well. So, so, um, so then it's kind of, what is the next step, right? So, well, I will tell you a little bit more about uh, the literature uh, finding that we were able to dig out to support some of the, um, uh, the, the biological implication later. But to summarize this part of the talk, that we actually um, established, we, through our own work, that we actually established that um, some, there's association of some plasma metabolites with physical function, physical function as well as cognitive function. And then particularly that we found this group of molecule, uh, hydroxy sphingomyelin, that seemed, seems to be of particular interest. So, um, so uh, one of the things that we, then we ask ourselves is that, are there literature uh, evidence that support the relationship uh, between hydroxy sphingomyelin and neurodegeneration? So, excuse me. So, we know that um, we know sphingomyelin um, a major lipid species that uh, exist in the myelin sheath uh, in the central and peripheral nervous system, and they play very the myelin sheath play a very important role to insulate, uh, like electronically, the axon of nerve cell, which is very essential for proper function uh, uh, of those nerve cells that in the uh, central and peripheral nerve system. So um, then we also know that um, sphingomyel hydroxy sphingomyelin are derivatives of Sphingomyelin. So the question is, are, are they present 
in those myelin sheets. It turned out that both actually sphingomyelin and hydroxy sphingomyelin are present in the myelin sheath in the central and peripheral nerve system. So then the next question is that um, what type of uh, sphingomy hydroxy sphingomyelin is that? Are we talking here, right? So I, as I mentioned to you before, that the hydroxy group that could be um, reside on either the sphingosine chain or the fatty acid chain. So we found through literature that um, the two hydroxy um, sphingomyelin actually are the most abundant one that are present in the uh, central and peripheral nerve system. So has the OH group on the uh, fatty acid chain at the alpha position. So then next question that we wonder is, what is responsible, what enzyme is responsible for synthesis of 2-hydroxy uh, sphingomyelin uh, in the uh, brain or in the uh, peripheral uh, nervous system? We found this very interesting enzyme called uh, fatty acid 2-hydroxylase. So without this enzyme, that fatty acid basically go through the normal uh, biochemical pathway uh, to be uh, incorporated to, and then to, uh, for synthesis of ceramide, sphingol, and then which later is uh, used for synthesis of sphingomyelin, uh, galactoceramide, uh, and uh, uh, glucoceramide. And so altogether, those species are considered sphingolipids. So, but with uh, hydro fatty acid 2 hydroxylase, that um, the alpha position of the fatty acid will be hydrolyzed. And then this 2 hydroxy fatty acid will be then incorporated into the same pathway that used to synthesize uh, sphingolipids and to actually produce hydroxy sphingolipids. So that's how um, the body, uh, the biological system works that to produce um, hydrox two hydroxy sphingolipids. And so, so what, what, a, what would be the biological actually implication of lacking uh, two hydroxy sphingolipids? Well, uh, fortunately that there has been um, studies of, um, of two uh, fatty acid, two hydroxylase knockout mice. So, so uh, first, this study shows that if the mice uh, lacks, uh, is deficient in fatty acid, two hydroxylase, it will have uh, actually uh, reduced the level of two hydroxy sphingolipids. So this is the, looking at the uh, lipids in brain, in myelin, and uh, sciatic nerve of those mice, and then compare to them to the, uh, their wild type control. Um, and specifically, uh, this uh, western blot, uh, those two western blot bands, looking at the non uh, hydroxy uh, galactoceramides and hydroxy galactoceramides. And it shows that uh, completely disappear of the hydroxy uh, galactoceramide group. Um, so again, this study that demonstrates that fatty acid 2 hydroxylase is very important for actually uh, synthesis of the hydroxy sphing sphingolipid uh, species. So um, then what is the then function, uh, functional implication of lacking uh, those hydroxy species? So this study actually uh, was able to demonstrate that in younger um, mice that um, there's no difference between the, um, uh, between the wild type and the, uh, the knockout mice that deficient in this enzyme. So this is the ultral structural analysis of the myelin. Um, and then you're looking at the cross-sectional um, structure of myelin and, uh, and the axon nerve cell. And then as you can see that there's no clear uh, differences. Um, however, that 
in um, aged uh, knockout mice, uh, for example, 18 month old uh, mice, compared to the uh, control, uh, the wild type, that there is actually a lot of uh, structural abnormalities, such as the um, microcystic spaces, as indicated here, and also that the splitting of the myelin sheath, and also the uh, collapse of those axon uh, cylinders. So those were the stru structural ab abnormalities that present in those uh, aged knockout mice. So um, indicating that uh, hydroxy single uh, lipid that may be important for long-term stability of myelin. And without it, it would lead to axon and myelin uh, sheath degeneration. And also, what about behavior of those knockout mice? It turns out that also that when they looking at walking behaviors that in those knockout mice, that they were able, they were able to found that those um, mice uh, deficient in the enzyme has reduced uh, distance traveled as well as slower uh, speed when they travel. Um, so again, this is consistent with our um, uh, result from human study that seems that lower level is associated with uh, worse physical function outcomes. So what about human subject that has uh, mutation in um, fatty acid 2 hydroxylase? <coughs> well, um, children with mutation in this gene that develop normally until 2 to 6 years of age, but then they start to exhibit frequent falls and walking disabilities, followed by um, progressive spasticism, spasticity and eventually lose ability to move and communicate. And also that this is consistent with in the uh, animal model that uh, hydroxy species of uh, spindle myelin may be critical for long-term stability of um, myelin nation, myelin and therefore lacking of that may lead to uh, neurodegeneration. And also that patients with this mutation also were found to have lower levels of hydroxysphingomyelin uh, uh, in the red blood cell. So in summary of the literature evidence that um, the fatty acid 2 hydroxylase is responsible for synthesis of uh, two hydroxy sphingolipids, and those mice with deficient in this enzyme lack those hydroxy uh, species of sphingolipids, and then absent of those uh, lipids are incompatible with, uh, you know, uh, is compatible, sorry, compatible with normal neural development, but would cause um, late onset of axon and myelin sheath degeneration. And also those mice deficient in the enzyme has reduced the ability to walk. Um, and then human subject with a mutation in this enzyme has lower level of hydroxy sphingomyelin in the red blood cells as well as physical function decline. So I'd like to um, summarize uh, so, uh, our findings. So basically, um, we established uh, that there's a connection between hydroxy sphingomyelin present in plasma with cognitive function decline, as well as uh, frailty, and particularly with the physical function decline characteristic, which is uh, that in frail uh, older adults. And so uh, we also found that um, a lot of supporting uh, literature evidence that indicating uh, the hydroxy sphingomyelin and other hydroxy uh, sphingolipid species that may be very important in the uh, in, in, um, de neurodegeneration. So I think we're very excited about uh, you know what we have found. Uh, so um, definitely we like to continue uh, this line of work. And particularly that we like to develop specific mass spec based method to measure uh, plasma hydroxy sphingomyelin and other hydroxy, uh, two hydroxy sphingolipid species 
to actually validate our finding in independent cohort and other diseases that physical function that uh, is affected. And also that we like to design studies to understand the protein interactive targets of the hydroxy sphingomyelin that and other and other hydroxy lipids um, and then potential molecular pathway and mechanisms that leading to physical function decline in frailty. And then also we like to continue to apply the uh, metabolomics approach to discover plasma biomarker of frailty in older adults. Um, which will, those biomarkers that can be used for risk prediction as surrogate biomarkers of, of functional outcomes as well as to understand the pathophysiological mechanisms for develop no, novel therapeutics to prevent and slow down physical function decline in older adults. So um, I really like to um, acknowledge the people that who have helped me with um, my work. And first I'd like to thank um, uh, John, uh, Dr. John Eckfeld, that who, he, who was the person that introduced me to the ERIC study. Um, and then also I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Fang Yu at uh, School of Nursing, and who has been helping me with my research and then grant writing, etc. And Dr. Alvaro Alonso, who was the PI of the ERIC study, and then who was here and now is, uh, now is at Emory. And he has been the last author for um, the two papers um, that I published last year. And also I'd like to thank Gwen uh, Winham, and who is a geriatric uh, um, uh, doctor that who is also helped me a lot with particularly the physical function uh, outcome paper. Uh, also, also I'd like to thank um, Fang Ying Huang and then uh, Dr. Lisa Johnson, um, who are my lab technician and also uh, my clinical chemistry postdoc, that uh, they have been also uh, participated in uh, this, um, actually exploring this study as well. So um, finally, I'd like to thank funding, uh, of course, the funding that supported Eric's study and the FIDAT trial. Um, and then also, I have a um, grant that from the Alzheimer's Association. Thank you for your attention. Hey, Mike. Thanks for your nice talk. Um, so it looks like in your most recent study you were basing all the analysis on visit five. Mm -hmm. And it seems like in the whole like translational pipeline you're trying to identify a biomarker associated with the disease and then think about ways to have early detection plus intervention plus improved outcome. That, that's a prospective trial, but retrospectively, are there enough samples from visits one through four that you could look at patients that had symptoms at visit five but didn't have them at the proceeding to kind of see how there's anything early that could, could predict which patients would go on to have this negative biomarker? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, I have wrote, I have written grants that, you know, hopefully to uh, secure funding to look at longitudinally that uh, the changes and the biomarkers associated with, you know, outcomes. So, yeah, definitely I'm very interested in doing that. It, it's, it will be more revealing as well. Yeah. Hey, John. Uh, Danny, it was fascinating. I, I have a general question about frailty. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, it kind of affects me. <laughs> but, uh, besides that, um, we all know that uh, both for physical and mental activity, you either use it or lose it. So, so my question is, do these people who get frailty, as they get older, become more sedentary and stop doing physical activity and then develop frailty? Or, they de or do they develop frailty for some of the biochemical and genetic things you talk about and then lose their physical activity and their mental activity because they previously developed frailty? Well, I wish I had good answers for your question, but I feel like the, it, it could both it could happen uh, in both scenarios that you just described, and um, it's it's very complex. And as you know, that all the different you know characteristics that used to define frailty, and some of them are very you know um, subjective, and some of them are, are very objective. And so I think that uh, it's. And this area of research is just emerging. So uh, even 
when it comes to looking at the frailty phenotype, maybe we have to break into a different uh, separate outcomes and looking at the biomarkers that with each you know outcome because otherwise it'd be probably too heterogeneous. So I, I wish that we have I I could answer your question, but I think it's probably happened in both situations. Okay. Hi. Hey, Dave. Really, uh, very nice talk and uh, line of research. So a couple of questions, um, and it may be too early in the game to know them, but is the FA2 uh, hydroxylase, uh, have you been able, or has anybody been able to measure that in the aged population to see of its message levels or whatever, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, relative to that, even if it were to be normal, there was a grand round some years ago by a physiologist at Mayo. And he did all these studies of you know, circulating uh, you know, um, mass spec kind of probes on um, proteins that he showed in aging, and he was looking at actin and myosin. Um, he showed that you're actually making abnormal proteins in as you age, and they're dysfunctional because yeah. of those abnormalities. So I wonder if you know it, if you or anybody else knows anything about those things. Yeah, so to answer your first question, you know, that's, that's why we're very excited about this study, because even though there's um, evidence that from animal studies and as well as some evidence from human subject with mutation in this gene that we haven't actually found people applying this uh, and looking at this biochemical pathways that in human research. And so that's why I'm very excited about this because we are just starting to exploring this specific pathway in you know human research. So so I think that um, there, there has been publications in terms of specifically how you use a mass spec based method to measure the enzymatic activity of this enzyme in uh, you know, cell lysate, and I'm sure it could be applied to plasma, but that hasn't been done. Um, so to your second question, you know, I think that's a bigger question is now as we age, right? Um, you know, maybe the enzyme, uh, the protein, uh, produced and it's, they're losing their enzymatic activity in such way that they're not as efficient to, you know, uh, hydroxylate uh, the sphingomyelin species. And I think that's probably, you know, uh, is the, related to the whole concept of aging and then, you know, so I think that's a bigger question. And I, I think it's likely that could be the reason why that is you know, lower level, and for example, in older people. Thanks. I know another. Uh, uh, again, because it's a fascinating line of research, one would wonder if you could do studies in MS where you've got a lot of uh, damage, uh, yeah. you know, all over the place. And, you know, the, the wonderful thing would be to have a, a biomarker, something you could measure. Uh, as you introduce new drugs and all this other kind of stuff. So. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that comment because, like I said, future direction, we definitely like to not just apply to understand frailty, and we also like to apply to other diseases that their physical function and is you know impaired in those patients, such as MS or Parkinson's diseases, for example. Jesse? So has do you know if anybody has looked at the ion knife technology, you know, but presented back on that? And, and generally, that, that system looks at a lipid profile that you can kind of profile with that. Mm -hmm. And it seems like your research would be really fitting with that, with just even like red blood cells. And if you went through and looked at the profile, and that's something simple, mm -hmm. um, and kind of maybe, you know, get some sort of profiling. Has anybody looked at that that you're aware of? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, there's a bunch of people, you know, there's a lot of newer technology in lipidomics and lipidomics and, you know, apply to, um, you know, plasma and other, uh, you know, tissue type of samples to looking for biomarker. And I think specifically, we, uh, instead of using the technology you described, we look, we're using uh, this targeted lipidomic method. Um, I think that it, to me, like I, I think you could always discover something uh, regardless what kind of technology that you apply. But the more important thing is really, you know, if, if you want to 
go beyond that step of just discovery something, then you really have to like sit down, you know, really understand the bio biology, and also really ask the question that beyond that uh, initial screening method, and then to understand that whether you can replicate your finding in a different cohort, and then so so that's actually one of the future directions that we like to do. Uh, we may not actually using another screening method, but instead we we will develop method that specifically focused on the biochemical pathways, and therefore that we you know will give us orthogonal information, um, and then hopefully we will be able to replicate the finding. A comment. Um, I think I'm going to try to get these people to meet with the art of people with yourself. Um, I heard a presentation maybe a year or two ago that Brooks Jackson arranged to have two uh, rocket scientists from United Health that work in their Optum division. And they're kind of interested in the question that Mike asked across the board what what may be happening earlier before the onset of disease or something like that. So they did an interesting, they did it live, and they interrogated 65 million patient records that they had longitudinally. And they were, they, they just asked, what do you want to look at? You know? So someone said diabetes and MI. So okay, we've got diabetes and MI, and then they, they interrogate that and they come up with literally millions of patients. And they found out in the, the two years prior to that, there was all sorts of uh, need of the patients to get into the healthcare system for some some number of things. So there was something going on uh, that was, you know, signaling uh, lack of health that made them, uh, you know, uh, suspect in this. They're obviously interested in that if you can find those, you can mitigate that, and then you know, you know, the best disease is no disease, right? It, doesn't cost anything. So um, I think I'm going to try to get their names and have them meet with the, the Ardell group because there may be a way that you and others can look at those databases. It, it, um, it was like awesome to see this live in real time. Okay, thank you.